thank you all for coming. My name is Annie Cooper, and I'm from the IC Secretariat in Copenhagen. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with IC, this is the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. And we've been in Copenhagen for over 110 years. And so I'm here today with two of my colleagues from the Secretariat. We have Borchek from the Science Department, Therapies from Data and Information, and I'm here representing Advisory Services. And it's not by accident that the three pillars of the IC Secretariat, along with a key member of the IC scientific community, are here today to talk about marine spatial planning. I say this because marine spatial planning is a very efficient vehicle for capitalizing on the many strengths that IC has as well as the synergies that are created through our unique combination of science, data, and advice, as well as our large scientific network. So before I go any further, I'd like to reframe my talk from challenges to opportunities. And I say this because marine spatial planning is not as much of a challenge to ICES as it is an opportunity to fulfill the science and data mission that was established over 110 years ago when ICES began. Marine spatial policy efforts provide a vehicle for ICES because our mission and our extensive network of marine science research institutions from every coastal state in the North Atlantic. And as such, ICES is very well positioned to inform marine spatial planning efforts in areas such as the Baltic. I know that many of you are members of, if not if, um, very familiar with the work of ICES. But I'd like to remind you, just as Cornelius did earlier today, that ICES does and is designed to do much more than provide advice on this year's fishery quotas. ICES is a global organization for ocean sustainability. We have long-standing working relationships with marine science, policy bodies, regulatory communities, and industry in every coastal state in the North Atlantic. And over 110 years ago, ICES was established to coordinate and promote marine science, to collect and maintain marine data for shared use, and to provide science-based advice on marine issues. And again, we have membership from every coastal state in the North Atlantic, including the USA and Canada. Before coming to ICES, I worked for the U.S. Senate Committee on Oceans and the Obama administration in rolling out the National Ocean Policy, which was really the vehicle for marine spatial planning in the United States. And I tell you that just so you have an idea of how many receptions and cocktail hours and dinner parties and seminars I have attended on ocean issues. And from all of those events, I'm pretty convinced that unless you're an ocean insider, like all of us, when, you think of, when people think of the ocean, this is what comes to their mind. If it's not an image from Finding Nemo, it's this. And it's an empty, peaceful, and most importantly, limitless expanse. It's often referred to as the, the frontier. But all of us know, because we're here to talk about marine spatial planning, that it is not, at least in the coastal zone. There's a real need for marine spatial planning or for the efficient, an efficient dialogue about how we use and value marine resources. So once we come to that realization, <laughs> this cartoon um, often emerges. So marine spatial planning is about how humans use and value the marine environment. It requires a legal framework and consistency between neighboring states. And to be successful, it, it relies on stakeholder input, public participation, and the best possible science and information to inform decision making. Now this cartoon looks pretty chaotic and overwhelming. We have shipping, passenger traffic, sewage outflows, beaches, onshore agriculture, ocean energy fields, protected species, tourism, as well as multiple states and jurisdictions. In this situation, there are clear winners and clear losers. And as 
activities and pressures increase in the coastal zone, that articulation between winners and losers could increase. This cartoon presents a very different view of the coastal zone. I think it's, more, it's a vision for what a successful marine spatial planning project would look like. I think that marine spatial planning in a way allows for more thoughtful decision making. Thank you. <laughs> it allows for more thoughtful decisions that allow for the blue economy to flourish while not requiring protected species or long-standing marine industries such as fishing to lose out to more powerful lobbies. This is a view of the ocean with less chaos and room for all of society's priorities. I see history and mission play well. They play directly into this perspective, to the goals and objectives of marine spatial planning. So ICES is a global organization for enhanced ocean sustainability. And as I said, we've been working in this field for 110 years, more than that, actually. And throughout, we've been, our mission has been to coordinate and promote marine science to truly advance the field, to collect and maintain marine data for shared use, and to provide science-based advice on marine issues. ICES is actively working to implement the ecosystem approach. As you see in this image on the slide, we're working on different ecosystem um, projects around the North Atlantic in a way to articulate these venues. Uh, and when I say that we're working to operationalize the ecosystem approach, when I say this, I mean that we're trying to find a way to make it usable for decision making makers. We're taking science and data out of the laboratory and into society. And this approach under, underpins the needs of marine spatial planning. To do this, ICES is able to easily draw upon our existing network and our existing capacity and databases to capitalize on the synergies between science, data, and advice. How we manage and protect the ocean to make informed and coordinated decisions about its use. How do we do this? This is the question behind marine spatial planning. And IC's role is to provide the best available science and spatial data for, to decision makers. We are, consider ourselves to be a transparent provider of non-political scientific advice, and we host spatial data in a way that is free and accessible to users. This is our role in marine spatial planning, and it is not one that we take lightly. So as usual, ICES has many expert groups that work on a variety of topics, and I've listed several of them here that are directly relevant to, um, or directly correlated with marine spatial planning. Rather than talk about all of them here, I will leave it to my colleagues to share specific examples that they find salient. But in short, I can tell you that there's been a flurry of activities since 2009 and many before that that are directly related to marine spatial planning. These are listed here, but I must say that most of the work that ICES does directly supports the, um, the, the science um, that would go into marine spatial planning. That is, ICES works on fisheries, renewable energies, marine and coastal uses and conflicts, cultural dimensions of ecosystem goods and services, as well as risk assessment procedures. So apart from this, I think that um, a key aspect of ICES competencies are data and information. And Pericles will talk more about these in his talk. But just so you know, we have the, the ICES spatial facility online. And that these are just a few of different examples of data products that have been produced out of the IC system that are relevant for marine spatial planning. And these data are publicly available and space, spatially explicit. They're used for informed decision making. They are free and open access. And the, they have massive potential for, um, we have massive potential for spatial data <coughs> within the IC's network. So now I'd like to give an example of how science and information can be used to inform a successful marine spatial planning project in a real world scenario. And I take this scenario from, um, from Cape Cod and Boston Harbor. 
So in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, there's a classic case for marine spatial planning in that here is the oldest European fishing grounds in the United States. This is where the pilgrims, when they got off the Mayflower, they fished for cod off of the, the hook of Cape Cod that you see on the bottom of, of the map. So that's the oldest European fishing grounds in the United States, or the, our oldest industry. Yet it is feeling direct competition today from the Defense Department, as well as from Ocean Energy. There are several wind farms that are slated for that region. So beyond that, there's a lot of shipping traffic. And that's what you see in that hockey stick type line um, moving towards the center. And in the center left is Boston Harbor. And again at the bottom is, is the tip of Cape Cod. And you can see the warm colors. They represent density of whales. So this area is a protected marine sanctuary for whales. And that's the box, the rectangle that you see in the middle of the slide. And in the early 2000s, the marine sanctuary managers came to the International Maritime Organization, who directs shipping traffic, <laughs> to try to cut down on the number of whale strikes that occur with ships. So we have thousands of passenger and commercial vessels moving through this area to get to Boston Harbor every year. And we have some of the most critically endangered whales living in this area. The white dots are um, observations of whales, and the colors are densities. Um, so using data and information, the sanctuary managers provided advice to the IMO on how to reduce ship strikes. With, I want to get my numbers right here. By moving the shipping lane, so by redirecting vessel traffic 12 degrees to the north, to an area with fewer whales and adding 10 to 22 minutes to vessel time. So time on the water was increased by 10 to 20 minutes by moving from the solid traffic line to the dotted traffic line. The ship strikes with whales are estimated to be reduced by 58%, and that's just for the endangered right whale. So this, I think, is a clear case of where commerce and conservation can work together by using data and information to inform decision making. This is a clear success for marine spatial planning. Yes, it is on a small scale, but it actually allows for these two, um, two activities to coexist in a reasonable fashion. So it kind of takes the false argument out of the equation for conservation and commerce. ISIS is building the foundation for this type of scientific advice on marine spatial planning with a multi-layered approach. We are doing this through the development of integrated ecosystem assessments and ecosystem overviews that are at the regional level that allow for regional priorities. We are also looking at ecosystem overviews that are, um, sorry, that ref these regional overviews reflect the dynamic nature of the marine environment and so they allow for iterative decision making. So if we think about the whale example and shipping again, <coughs> that information can be used in an iterative process. So if whales <laughs> decide to move north um, and ship strikes increase again, the data and information can tell us about where the males are, whales are moving, where the strikes are happening, and hopefully that can provide the foundation for a new decision to be made about to continue to reduce ship strikes with whales. So that type of iterative process is something that ICES is working very hard on because we recognize that marine systems are not static. And especially as we manage marine systems better, um, things may be moving around or increasing um, and f that we haven't seen within our lifetimes or recent history. So preparing for that not static situation is very important in the advice that ICES gives. We're also uh, actively working at ICES to move beyond short-term single issue advice. Um, so to move from giving advice on Eastern Baltic cod for 2015 fishing season, 
we're working to give advice on all fisheries in the Baltic or all pelagic fisheries and sand eels in the Baltic. Um, so we're really working to be more integrative in our own, in our own work and in our relationship um, with clients so that we get requests for advice that, that are more holistic in nature um, and that can provide more for better informed decisions on these dynamic ecosystems. We're also working to facilitate the availability and use of spatial data through the data center. And we're actively working to build our network's capacity to fulfill IC's mission, again, to coordinate and promote marine science, to collect and maintain marine data for shared use, and to provide science-based advice on marine issues. This last point, I will say, requires our network um, to culture a new generation of scientists with inter interdisciplinary backgrounds and the ability to work as a member of a multidisciplinary scientific advisory group. ICES is working on several fronts to facilitate, and we really appreciate your interest in this session and in the topic in general. And I'm not sure, Vorchek, if you would like to just take questions at the end or... Yeah. Great. So thank you for your attention, and I'll pass this off to my colleagues. All right. Uh, thank you, Annie. My, um, uh, my name is Wojciech Wawrzyński. Uh, I'm also working for uh, the IC Secretariat. I'm a doctor of um, economical uh, sciences and a professor of, uh, um, of the Berlin School of Economics and Law. Uh, and at ICES, I'm the projects coordinator and um, a member of the ICES working group for resilience and marine ecosystem services. And uh, just lately, I've been given another affiliation uh, as the deputy head of uh, the science program in ICES. And today, I will uh, present to you um, um, the uh, MSP directive, and uh, that's a bit of a forward look for a science contribution to it and um, what is happening in, in the pr in present, um, and what, what was happening in the past with regards to science input uh, to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Um, so yeah, starting with those um, EU directives, um, it, um, I think the, the, the series of um, related to this topic, uh, EU directives um, began at 2000 um, when uh, we had, and the um, Water Framework Directive in the EU that was initiated, and it, uh, it called for a good uh, ecological status of, the, of groundwaters in the EU. And then, um, and then in 2008, uh, there was another directive, uh, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. It also called for a GES, but this time it's a good environmental status of marine waters. Um, and. Um, yeah, and, 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 and since then, I mean, this, uh, we can look at uh, the, the science input to, to the MSFD, which, in which ICES has been uh, quite active, and we can, uh, on the basis of that, we can envisage the science input to, uh, to the MSP directive. Uh, so in MSFD, there was this timeline. Um, it's a, it is a EU, EU directive, so it sets um, the end point, which is uh, achieving a good environmental status by uh, the year 2020, and it has all these uh, uh, steps uh, um, of defining good environmental status, what it is, uh, setting targets. Um, um, right now, we're, we are in the middle of the, uh, the process of um, constructing the programs of measures, and then monitoring program to uh, achieve or s uh, to prove that uh, the GES uh, is um, sustained. Um, for that, in Europe, we have uh, uh, something that is called the Common Implementation Strategy. Uh, we have a group of the, the heads of uh, the MSFD from different countries. They are appointed by their Ministry uh, of Environment, and they're called uh, Marine Directors. Uh, and they, um, they look at it from a very strategic broad point of view, um, and they define the Common Implementation Strategy. Um, so. In, Perhaps in the future, when it comes to uh, MSP directive, it may be the same or similar case. Um, there, a group will be created and a common implementation strategy for the whole Europe uh, can be um, put in place. 
And then the European Commission, um, uh, they founded uh, several uh, working groups on a sort of a lower level. Um, these working groups are for um, coordination from, for, for um, MSFD, um, determination of GS, right, right here we have uh, uh, the working group for mapping a, a, an assessment of ecosystems and their services, um, WG MIAS. There's a, a, a group, a project coordination group to coordinate all the um, scientific projects related to MSFD. And there is, for instance, this uh, closest to ICES, the D3 Plus working group um, of the European Commission. Um, D3 is uh, the, well, the MSFD uh, has 11 descriptors. Uh, descriptor 3 is commercial fish catches. And then now because the, the um, commercial fish catches uh, interact closely with uh, other descriptors, mostly from the biodiversity uh, theme, which are um, food webs and seafloor integrity, uh, we have the D3 Plus process, which is sort of a, uh, an informal group of scientists uh, dealing with interactions uh, between those uh, descriptors. Um, and yes, ICES is participating in, uh, in the um, also informal uh, um, meetings of the marine directors. And the last one you can see here was uh, this month, uh, and the marine directors, in terms of scientific input to MSFD, uh, um, they um, clarified expectations from ICs, from other uh, scientific or science advisory bodies uh, like GFCM to, to that's the Ger uh, General Fisheries, Fisheries Commission from the, from, for the Mediterranean uh, to work together uh, also uh, with uh, fish, fishery um, regional bodies um, and uh, following that uh, with FAO. So um, we um, were following those um, recommendations and uh, organizing cooperation between those, those uh, science policy bodies. In terms of uh, science itself, DG um, Director General for Research and Innovation um, funded several projects uh, to um, un um, underpin the implementation of the, of the MSFD. Uh, one of the projects, uh, one of the major projects uh, is the STAGES project. Um, science and Technology Advancing Governance of Good Environmental Status. It is actually finishing very soon. Uh, from this meeting, I'm going to the stage's final uh, workshop in Brussels. Um, so it, uh, for two years, uh, the consortium, ICES included, we have uh, uh, worked on improving the current scientific knowledge base and uh, connect science to policy um, to help achieve good environmental uh, status of marine waters and to support uh, MSFD implementation in general. Um, well, the, the deliverables, I'm going to just touch uh, uh, upon several of them here. Um, you have, uh, they're available, of course, on these stages projects, that EU website, um, and uh, uh, on our IC stand uh, in, the, in the corridor, you, you can see some uh, progress reports of that project. Um, so, first of all, uh, what we did was uh, identified uh, the existing knowledge um, stemming, that is stemming from EU projects, but also national projects and, and regional um, scientific projects. So we, we had uh, over 1,500 EU projects um, analyzed and, and almost the same number of, of national projects. And uh, we created those state-of-the-art reports, uh, which are supposed to be user-friendly, so um, a manager of uh, MSFD can look at what uh, knowledge is available in terms of scientific input to, to the, uh, to the um, directive. So you can go um, descriptor by descriptor, and, and, uh, and we created those uh, state-of-the-art reports um, where you can find all that and also this uh, science policy briefing on the, the needs for uh, further research, uh, the needs that were, were identified by uh, international scientific community. Now, uh, right now we're in the, uh, the level of programs of measures and uh, in terms of scientific input. ICES, uh, for instance, uh, conducts a pilot study on the interaction between uh, different programs of measures to tackle eutrophication and fisheries in the Baltic. Uh, it is called uh, Assessing Trade-offs of Programs of Measures, and um, it gathered a, a group of um, scientists from different institutions around the Baltic, 
um, and they investigate potential scientific inputs to assess MSFD programs of measures. Um, the first report of, of that task will be presented in Brussels uh, the day after tomorrow, and then the final report should be ready and hang on the website in about two months from now. Uh, another thing is the science policy interface planning. What is interesting in terms of uh, uh, MS, uh, um, Marines, um, sorry, MSP directive in the future is that here, uh, um, in the case of MSFD, the commission decided that they want some kind of recommendation on how a science policy, um, European-wide science policy platform uh, that would help um, implementing the directive could look like. So Stages Project also um, generated some kind of recommendations. Um, but there were, were parallel processes, and actually what the, the uh, is coming from the work of the marine directors, um, it, for the time being, it, it looks like there will be, uh, it, and it is being created, it's called a, um, a Marine Competence Center for Good Environmental Status. Um, so it will be um, situated at the Joint Research Center of, of the European Commission in East Pride in Italy, and they will um, be the, the, the leading uh, center for science input to MSFD. And uh, again, going um, descriptor by descriptor, um, the direct marine directors decided that uh, both ICs and JRC will have a role, uh, specific role, depending on um, which descriptors we're talking about. Um, you can see all that in the, uh, in the reports from the European Commission to the Council and the European Parliament on the implementation on MSFD. Those are um, available uh, on the internet. The last one you can see here from, um, from February this year. So that's how uh, scientific input, um, especially that, the one that considers ICs, looks like for the time being to MSFD. Um, now, the MSP directive uh, in March 2013, uh, the Commission proposed uh, the legislation to create a common framework for, for MSP and integrate the coastal zone management, uh, where um, each country will be free to plan uh, its own maritime activities, and there will be um, a shared uh, coordination through a, a, a set of uh, minimum uh, common requirements for throwing up uh, national MSP plans by 2021 in this case. The policy context is uh, um, of both these directives. Um, uh, you can go back to the Blue Book uh, of 2007, um, and it all, it all goes under the uh, integrated EU maritime policy. Um, and over there, um, both topics and advancements were uh, envisioned. So, uh, in terms of ICs, uh, input for the future, uh, an MSP directive. Now, because it aims at establishing co common framework uh, for MSP and uh, ICs at M, um, with a view to, uh, to ensuring the growth of marine and coastal activities uh, and the use of resources uh, at sea remains sustainable. Um, so, yeah, sustain sustainable use of living resources is in the core of the IC science uh, work and advisory as well. So um, here is a, a clear potential for the future. Um, there was an uh, impact assessment um, performed last year uh, of the MSP directive. Um, and th those here listed are the economic ones. Um, there is uh, environmental assessment uh, done as well as, uh, and, a s and social assessment. Um, but it points to the fact that uh, um, what is expected is the, re first of all, reduced transition costs for maritime business, uh, improved ac attractiveness of coastal regions through um, preservation of nat natural and amenity values, uh, reduced coordination costs for, for public authorities, uh, and then when it comes to innovation and research, uh, data needs, but Pericles will uh, talk uh, to you about that in detail. Um, so it is all about blue growth. It refers to the blue, blue growth agenda in Europe, um, and that's the major expectation of, of the MSP uh, regulation. Also reducing regu regulatory complexity uh, as the current fragmented sea space uh, management leads to overregulation. Um, I'm not really sure about um, this uh, being delivered in the near future. I mean, when it comes to um, from a regional perspective, um, 
last week I was in uh, in Bilbao, in País Vasco, in, in Spain, and and of course uh, um, regions like this will lose uh, a bit of their uh, responsibilities, a bit of their um, regulatory capacity to Brussels, and and so there there um, have been protests, regular uh, regional protests about this uh, here and there, um, but. Either way, there we have it. The European Parliament adopted uh, the uh, Maritime Spatial Planning Directive two months ago, and um, as we heard today, next month uh, the Council will put a final step, uh, stamp on it. Again, it's an EU directive, just like the, the previous case of uh, MSFD. Um, it, it tells the countries uh, of what to achieve, but not really how to achieve. Uh, so there is some kind of flexibility. And now, because it points also to a consistency with other regulations, uh, MSFD, but not, not also um, the common fisheries policy as well, there is a clear um, potential uh, of input, scientific input, to implementation of, of these directives. Um, and another thing I would like to show you is also a recent uh, um, development from earlier this month. Uh, on the website, uh, mspchallenge.org, you can see uh, there is a, a new maritime spatial planning challenge. Um, it, uh, it refers to two um, computer games. It is serious gaming. It's um, something like uh, IC has also contributed in the past uh, for um, running aquaculture farms, distant running, uh, running of aquaculture farms and managing. Um, so two... Um, Games were created, uh, MSP Challenge 2011, then it was sort of uh, more developed, uh, updated, uh, and another game, MSP Challenge 2050, was created. Um, not going into detail what they're all about, but, uh, but it's for managers to, um, to sort of play and, and, and uh, learn how to decide, learn what the conflicts, space conflicts are, and, and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, ICES contributed to this. This was led by the Dutch, the, the Dutch Ministry of uh, Infrastructure. And it's all there on the, on the website. And uh, now, yeah, I have a, a blank slide. It's not the last slide, but it's, uh, it's just to tell you that this is being developed further with the first uh, round of uh, Horizon 2020. Now, blank slide, because I cannot tell any details here, um, because there are still nine days uh, until the projects can uh, can be submitted. All I can tell you is that this uh, will be called a Galene. A Galene is a, uh, a name of a Greek um, goddess of calm seas. Um, but the idea is to develop further this uh, serious gaming in MSP, and, and it is most probably uh, coming. Um, yeah, that said, uh, I would uh, like to. Yeah, that's the last thing. I, I am the co organizer of this session, so I actually have those. Uh, yellow and red cards for myself. I'm not going to use them. I can see the time here. It's almost up, but I'm finishing, seriously, three more slides. Um, I would like to uh, um, announce and invite everybody for the annual science conference uh, of ICES. It's done every year. This year it's in La Coruña in Spain. Next year is in Denmark and Copenhagen. Um, and point to the fact that we have two of our uh, theme sessions related to uh, maritime spatial planning. Uh, the science and tools for management of uh, networks of marine protected areas and the application of, of science for ecosystem-based management of aquaculture. And actually with the, the first call of Horizon, uh, there is a topic on, uh, on uh, MSP of, uh, uh, in relation to aquaculture. So um, I'll leave you with that. Uh, I am just going to tell that there is a ICES working group for maritime spatial planning and coastal zone management. And, uh, uh, Kira G will be presenting this to you uh, up next. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting us to present the work of the ICES working group with the lovely acronym WGMPCZM. ICES is the organization with the best acronyms in the world. And there's lots of them, lots of groups, as Annie already mentioned in her introductory um, presentation. I'm actually presenting this on behalf of the chair of the group, which is Andreas Cannon, who is not able to be here today. So um, I'll do my best to present you with a good overview of what the group actually does. Now, um, the group first actually came about in way back 2003, when it was a um, study group, as it was originally called, um, very much focused on ICZM back then. 
It then became a working group. Please don't ask me exactly what the difference is. In 2006, and then sort of included um, marine spatial planning as this became more prominent a topic in 2011. There was some um, idea to maybe actually shift focus entirely on MSP, but um, at the time it was decided to keep the ICZM angle in there on purpose because of the land-sea interaction and because of the connections that then were felt to exist very strongly between um, ICZM on the one hand and MSP as an emerging new tool on the other. Um, the group used to have um, terms of reference just defined for one year. Now it actually changed um, and we've now got um, terms of reference for a three-year period. The first three-year period is 2014 to 2016. So brand new, if you like, a brand new work plan which we've just started to um, work on. I should say that there's a number of other members of the working group actually in the room, so in case you have any questions later on, feel free to ask them as well. I've been a member of the group since, uh, actually I'm not entirely sure, I think it's about three years now. So again, I'll do my best to cover the early stages of the group as well. Um, altogether, our group has about 50 members. Now that sounds a lot, but um, in fact, um, not all of them attend every meeting. It's also important to point out that each IC's working group actually has country nominated members and also members who are invited by the chair because of specific ex expertise or experience they can bring to the group. So our group, we would say, has probably about 16, 18, maybe sometimes 20 participants per meeting. We meet once a year regularly and um, also have um, dedicated workshops and I'll come on to those in a moment. Who are we? Well, we are a range of different scientists representing both natural and also, importantly, social scientists. And also, very important, a direct link to practice. So we also have representatives in the group uh, from various planning authorities. And as already mentioned, the group has the possibility to draw on additional expertise for specific workshops or specific topic areas, um, if that is needed. So how do we work? Well, we really cover a very broad range of topics. Um, one thing that sets us apart maybe from some of the other ICES working groups is that we don't actually focus on, on data primarily. We don't actually focus on hard science, if you like. We actually focus more on plans and on conceptual issues, uh, looking also very much at examples that come from practice, from practitioners and planners themselves, um, to try and come towards solutions for these issues. Um, specific topics I'll show you in a moment. Um, one important point is that we do publish corporate cooperative research reports, that's the other acronym, CRR, um, with the idea of providing guidance specifically to MSP practitioners. So again, it's not sort of scientific papers, which of course also result from the work of the group, but actual hands-on guiding documents intended to help those who actually have to grapple with these issues in practice. So what are the topics that the group is primarily addressing? Um, here's some examples. One is actually focusing on risk management approaches in MSP and ecosystem-based management. Another is looking at the processes of MSP and ecosystem-based management, and especially in that context, the role of scientific advice. And the third example is the inclusion of cultural dimensions in marine spatial planning and again, ecosystem-based management. So with respect to risk management, what have we actually done? What have we achieved so far? We had a session specifically dedicated to risk management um, at the annual science conference back in 2010. And from that resulted a cooperative research report on marine and coastal ecosystem-based risk management. So it's there for you to read if you fancy having a look at that. There's another cooperative research report specifically about risk management, which is more detailed really in describing the approach that the group has discussed and puts forward. And that was then developed even further in 2014, so really recently, um, at a workshop in Amsterdam, which was organized jointly with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans from Canada, and which looked at a specific method, really, for risk assessment for spatial management. 
And it's probably fair to say that this topic has attracted quite a bit of attention, really, including other organisations. The Arctic Council, for example, has been quite interested in this. Um, and the idea of these reports and the idea of the approach is really to provide structure to a process for how risk management could be approached, how to do risk management, which information to include, which groups need to be included, which science needs to be included, at which point, and how it might need to be adapted to regional specifics and um, specific regional, well, yeah, regional needs, essentially. I should also point out that this approach is very much based on an ISO approach, so it's based on ISO terminology and on the ISO structure for approaching risk management, which is quite interesting, quite unusual. And it has resulted in scientific publication, well, it will, rather, it will hopefully soon result in a scientific publication as well. MSP processes, what do we mean by this? Um, again, um, Workshops were the primary mode of, of um, addressing this question or addressing this issue and here the key word has been how can we provide some sort of quality assurance for marine spatial planning or for integrated management processes as a whole. We've had a workshop in Canada in Bedford on that topic and we've also had a session at the 2012 annual science conference. Again looking at the sort of multidisciplinary perspectives here and how science can be used to um, bring quality to marine spatial planning processes and how scientific advice in particular can support it in a, in a sensible and useful way. And here also um, two cooperative research reports are in preparation. It's nearly finished, the one that's I think the most interesting one, the one that actually looks at the method that we have proposed for quality assurance. And the second one is then the report from the Annual Science Conference 2012. So watch this space. And then lastly, just quickly, um, cultural dimensions. Um, and um, if you want to learn more, um, I'll be going into that in a little more detail tomorrow morning in a separate uh, session. This is really recognizing that cultural dimensions tend to be neglected a little bit when we talk about the sea and when we look at research addressing MSP needs in particular. And this morning we heard from various people that it's actually all about people and, it, um, and you know, marine spatial planning isn't an abstract exercise. We are dealing with, with cultures, with people, with livelihoods here. So cultural dimensions seem a worthwhile topic to actually dedicate some workshop time to and to try and work out ways of capturing these dimensions and mapping them so to make them more accessible to marine spatial planning. Again, we have um, produced a report which is available for you, um, preparing the obligatory scientific publications. But um, there's actually two um, follow-on projects currently running, one in the UK, one in Canada, involving uh, working group members who are actually trialing this method that we have proposed in practice to see whether it is actually operational. I mean, it's very well sitting around a table, dreaming up nice ideas, but it's actually got to stand the test of practice when it comes to, um, but to using this. Um, what we've done essentially is to try and take it a step beyond just mapping um, areas that could be of cultural interest. Uh, we've also tried to come up with criteria that could determine cultural significance, a bit like criteria for determining ecological significance or economic significance, if you like. And here you can see the criteria that we have come up with. And um, well, again, I'll, I'll be able to go into more detail tomorrow. Um, some aspects to consider, especially if we are then taking it yet another step forward, which is to move towards risk assessment or risk management, which is of course important in marine spatial planning. I mean, it's one thing identifying an area as important for cultural reasons, but what about the risks that might be incurred from developments uh, or from, from changes in the environment or from other uses? And here's just some elements that seemed relevant for um, determining significance and also the risks um, to areas that are important culturally. Um, environmental quality is one, and also the last point, um, if I could just point that one out to you, um, because we're talking of, of, about cultural dimensions, we are effectively also talking about specific social groups, different social groups, conflicts between different perceptions of groups, and points of planning that might lead to resistance or 
uh, lack of cooperation from, from user groups or groups of interest. So um, just to give you some idea as to what we are still planning to do in the remaining three years of our, annual, uh, of our terms of reference, um, what we do on a regular basis is um, every year to actually review um, MSP relevant uh, activities in the various ICs member states. There will be a review paper in 2016 drawing together developments in the period up to then. We're also going to look some more at approaches and different methods available for, um, in co for um, de defining thresholds for acceptable change, and by that we mean environmental as well as social change in the context of MSP. Um, we'll be looking forward to some more workshops um, on that topic in 2015 and 2016. And we'll also be producing a typology of conflicts in MSP. Um, which is useful if you want to, well, effectively deal with different types of conflict, and that's recognizing, again, that conflicts can be context-specific, can be group-specific, can be arising from very different situations, can be hot conflicts, cold conflicts, all different types of things. And it's useful to be a bit more precise in, in defining the type of conflict you're dealing with before you are looking for solutions. So here we're proposing to develop this typology. And last not least, training, which was mentioned just um, a moment ago. Uh, we'll also be providing a training event, a training course uh, later this year um, in order to support the gaming simulation that was just presented a moment ago, the MSP Challenge 2050 in particular. Um, lastly, I should say that we are, of course, even though we don't deal with data as such really as a core topic, um, we are also looking to support the ICS Data Centre um, with respect to a strategy for key data sets that actually really supports MSP on the ground. So looking at data needs, data requirements uh, from planners and also support for then developing planning solutions. But then again, the disclaimer that we don't actually provide those data sets ourselves. It's really more a needs analysis that we can probably help with. Um, how do we know that what we are doing is actually being effective? Well, there has been quite a lot of knowledge transfer that has been going on within the group itself and also from the group out to the wider world of MSP. And um, the group is an open group in the sense that it is very open towards ideas or developments coming from IC's uh, member states or from um, the planning um, world as a whole. Um, and he's also very happy to then sort of pass that back, if you like. And one example is the cultural ecosystem work that has now gone into trial, I suppose, at two sites in the UK and in Canada, as I've uh, described before. So that was my quick run through, I believe. Yes. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer. Thank you.